Just live. It's the final cut. No edits. Really? That's it. So right. talk. Okay, here we go. Susu Talk podcast here in Oakland in the studio. Raquel Goldman, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having Boom. me. Boom. Should I say chef? <laughs> Raquel Goldman, what's up? What's up? How you doing? Good. Good. You just uh, came over to the Bay Bridge. Yep. Yeah, was it a disaster? It was slow, but not bad. Right. How long did it take you to get here? About 45, 50 minutes. What is the shortest amount of time that you've ever crossed over the Bay Ooh. Bridge? Easy, like 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Never seen that day. So yeah. hopefully. That's an early morning day. One day, right? You get there at 4.30. Yeah. You right? cross that bridge right at 5. five. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Yeah. Today I was on my way into to train at Google mm-hmm. and I'm rolling over the bridge. And it's like, if you stay in the regular lanes, yeah. it's like one hour. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I took the, I took the HOV. Yeah. I was by myself. <laughs> I sinned. Yes, you you risked that, huh? Yeah, I risked it. I risked it. How much time did it cut off your commute? Uh, thirty minutes. Wow. Yeah, That's straight good. up. Yeah, good I mean, hey, you. I got there on time. You yeah. know, hey, yeah, I got there with time to spare. Good. And realized I thought the, I was at the wrong building, so I had oh. to walk fifteen minutes anyway. Oof. So I was fine. I was still, still on time. Yeah, time. I was still on time. Okay. I was like, yeah, like, chilling. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's over there by uh, their Google offices are where the punchline is punchline comedy club uh-huh yeah crazy little spot over there yeah i don't yeah. know what neighborhood that is but Interesting. anyway okay norte 54 that's right norte 54 all right bakery bakery okay Can, are you also a savory cook <sighs> no no just pastries just pastries mm-hmm. okay and pan dulce, pan dulce. Mm-hmm. have you been always baking since you were a kid um uh, recreationally yes yeah, yeah it was something i would I've always done mm-hmm. making large messes at home. <laughs> um, was it through mom that that came about? Yeah, you know, my mom was an avid cook. Mm-hmm. She's an avid cook, good baker herself. Um, she's always she's always been in the kitchen. Um, she doesn't she didn't always let us be in the kitchen. Uh, but when I got older, maybe like fifth grade or so, I mm-hmm. remember. Remember, you know, you, the Scholastic book orders. Yeah, Scholastic. <laughs> Damn. I ordered a like a cookie of the month yeah uh, recipe cookbook and i remember like cranking out messes and making batches of probably uneatable cookies but there i was in the kitchen right that's dope. um yeah i've always loved it uh and <clears throat> definitely carried it on through um you know high school and mm. college but also thinking about like well you know you're in college you need to be doing something that is career focused or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever that means. <clears throat> oh, crazy. Um, so you kind of saw yourself doing this professionally at some point? No, no, never. Not for a long time. Right. I, I kind of like let it be on the, that back burner, kind of like this weird itch mm-hmm. thinking like, that's not something people really do. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to grow up and be professional right. in, in the sense of, I think what we're, you know, presented with Mm -hmm. as kids or some kids are um yeah so i i went into school thinking maybe i'll study medicine and then that didn't pan out and Mm -hmm. thought maybe i'll study art which is essentially what i graduated with an art degree um with the intention of studying something in design Mm -hmm. or architecture these are things that i i do love and i'm very passionate about um but in the course of, you know, taking on all the different art classes that I did, I could never sort of find that calling or that passion with each medium. I was like, oh, I like this one. No, I like this one. I like mm-hmm. that one. Um, but in the, in the meantime, I was always cooking. I was always baking. And it, that's something that I always connected to. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until maybe 20 years later that I thought, all right, enough already. Like, right, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to do this. Damn. Um, yeah. It takes a lot to it, do that. It took a long time. What did your friends say and your family say when you said you were going to do this? Uh, were they with you or were they were like, you're fucking ta loca? Uh, maybe a little bit of both. Right. But at this point, like you're looking at a 40-year-old me and there's like, <laughs> there's not much that, you know, people are going to tell you at that age. Like, okay, right. fine. I guess you're going to go do that. And 
Um, I was lucky enough to be here in San Francisco when I made that decision. And there was a, a cooking school that's now closed um, that had a really fast track program. They get you in like six months in class, like full time. Right. And then three months, they pop you into either a restaurant or a bakery. Mm-hmm. And that was just such a great experience, sort of like this fast track, no nonsense, learn all the basic stuff that you need to know and everything else you'll learn like while you're on the job or in your training. And what was the school? <clears throat> San Francisco cooking school, San Francisco cooking school. Mm-hmm. Who are the chefs? Like what was the organization? Why are they no longer? Why around? a COVID? Oh, COVID. Yeah. Okay. Small school then. A very small school. Where was the classroom? Where was the, the school was located in, um, San Francisco, mm-hmm. right on Turk and Van Ness. Right. Um, so I guess that's kind of like Knob Hill, Tenderloin adjacent. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a school founded by this woman named Jody Liano. I think she had, she was a chef in her previous life. And she had a lot of contacts with great restaurants in the city. Mm-hmm. And with this passion of creating a school, but eliminating a lot of what uh, typical culinary programs tend to do, which is you know, teach these old methods and teach these all like um, antiquated things that, you know, you don't need when you're heading into a restaurant setting or a bakery setting. Right. Um, so she collaborated with a lot of uh, friends and chefs in the city to create a curriculum that just kind of was like, what do you need when you want to hire somebody? What do you need them to know? Mm-hmm. And um, what can we eliminate from the typical like two year or four year curriculum? The bullshit. Mm hmm. Damn. Yeah. Right to the point. Right to the point. And when they say full, when you say full time, was it five days a week, eight hours? Yeah. Yeah. Close to that. Okay. Yeah. Got you. So like Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. What was the curriculum like? Like, was it theory and hands on every day or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it was um, for the pastry side, which, which I can't speak to the culinary Mm -hmm. side, but I was in pastry. It was, um, you know, broken, broken into blocks of the different things that you would go through in a culinary program. So these next two weeks are going to be bread focused. So Mm -hmm. we just learn about bread and like sourdough and all the different kinds of breads where this, these next two weeks are going to be focused on lamination. So Mm -hmm. you learn about all the the croissant, you know, world or chocolate making or, so it's just like broken down into like chunks of time for each subject. Mm -hmm. Okay. And six months you're done. Six months. And then after where they place you, so I got placed um, in Nopa. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Nopa? Nopa Pastry. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So who was the chef at the time, the pastry chef? Pastry chef uh, at the time and currently okay. is Elise Moore. Okay, Elise yeah. Moore, pastry yeah. chef. Dope. Yeah, she's great. She's learned a lot from her. Yeah. Yeah. And so how, i never been to Nopa, so how's the, what's the setup there? Is it like a la carte kitchen? So we, yeah, it's a restaurant. Okay. Um, yeah. American, California. Mm-hmm. Style. And yeah, it's a la carte. Okay, a la carte. Okay, got you. Um, I think I know, I was opening a restaurant recently and mm-hmm. I had a cook from there mm-hmm. that worked for me for like four hours. Okay. And it was the worst service in my oh, life. No. It, it was horrible. <laughs> I'm sorry. He never came that. back. He never, he was like, fuck this. I'm out of here. Yeah. So um, if he's out there, shout out to you. I love you. <laughs> Thanks for sticking up. Thanks for four hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. He's like, fuck this. I'm out. That's funny. Yeah. You know, shit happens. But yeah. Nopa. Yeah. Okay. How long were you there? I was there for a year. So my program that I went into was um, the summer of 2018. Kind of carried, like six months carried me into the new year, 2019. Right. And then we, and then I was hired. I'd stayed on. Mm-hmm. Um. Like it just, it just kind of worked out. That's not always the, that's not always the case. In fact, I wasn't expecting to be offered a job just because they already had a full pastry team. But, but as luck would have it, some of, one, somebody on the pastry team was leaving. And so they offered me uh, the spot, which was really great. Mm-hmm. It did take a little bit to convince myself that I, you know, wanted it and wanted to be there or like could be there. Um, but then after... I think I started working there officially in March of 2019 mm. and worked all the way till March 2020. Got it. And then COVID hit 
What did um, you do during COVID? So uh, during COVID, after the like the restaurant shut down, right. I went back home. I have four kids, so I focused on the kids. Mm-hmm. You know, they were all in ranging territories of like either elementary or middle school. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of transitioning into zoom school. And that's like when you have younger kids in school, that's a lot of hands on. But when you have younger kids during COVID zoom school is a whole nother like headache to manage. So, you know, essentially being like a personal secretary to my youngest child, you know, like typing stuff for him and um, helping him stay on schedule. Like it's any parent who had, young children during that time in school that's a whole nother job um whoa so i was home with them and that was fine um but in the meantime i was thinking like okay what is going to be my next move professionally do i get to return to the restaurant is like when is that happening we didn't know anything of like how how long covid was going to be there was Mm -hmm. no vaccine so there was no really knowing and restaurants didn't know what they were doing either everyone was you know pivoting to these takeout situations and yeah um and in the meantime, I was watching a lot of fellow pastry people start to churn out these pastry boxes, which were really fascinating. Like, you know, the pastry chef at Liho Liho was making mm. like these amazing pastries and selling them as boxes. Um, and a bunch of other people I saw through Instagram were doing these things. So I was like, well, maybe I can do that too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was like, well, I can't just turn out any ordinary pastry it has to be something that like is unique to me and something that um, feels authentic to me yeah um you know and all the all throughout um my time in pastry school I I always had this vision coming having grown up even though I am Mexican Mm -hmm. and I was born in Mexico I grew up in Miami so a lot of my exposure is Cuban food Mm -hmm. um and I always envisioned like I'll just open up a ventanita, you know, like sell <laughs> Cuban coffee and pastelitos. And that'll go. be, that'll be, like, that's amazing. Right. I love those things. It's one of those nostalgic childhood situations where I remember being over at friends' houses and like that pink bakery box would show up. You open it, there'll be all these pastelitos, like the <laughs> guayaba and, um. Damn, guayaba. Like, right? Like all those that's delicious, so good. delicious pastries. Um, but in pastry school, every time we had sort of this chance to like freestyle, it'd be mm-hmm. like, here's a recipe, you get to play with it. You don't have to follow it exactly like it says. You can add your own like spin on it. My instincts always took me, I always thought it would take me like the Cuban route. Yeah. And instead I was like, nope, leaning into like my Mexican heritage. So I was like, okay, well, clearly like something's coming up for me, you know, yeah. that I got to tap into this. So when I, um, when I had this idea of the pastry box, I was like, well, why don't I just learn what I can about pan dulce like mm-hmm. now that I have the time. So I spent all of COVID summer just playing at home, going on YouTube, <laughs> reading up on like whatever I could YouTube find. YouTube University. Seriously. Shit works. So many amazing um, panaderos, panaderas online. Um, and I just got to learn about all these like different pan dulces that mm-hmm. we have in Mexico City or in Mexico, not just Mexico City. And then, you know, learning from sort of taking what I had learned from recipe development at school and learning from chefs online <clears throat> and then just sort of like inserting myself in the middle, right? you know, because we each as chefs, we each bring our own take and flavor to what we do. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, and I just started to play around and be like, okay, I guess by the time September rolled around, I thought, okay, I think I'm ready to launch a box and kind of just like dropped it in my personal Instagram. Like, guess what? I'm doing this, you know? Yeah. And I I think I just did a Google Doc at the time where I just said there's 30 boxes available and they're going to be delivered Saturday morning. I'm like, here you go. Like, sign up and buy. Right. You know, and like they sold out fast. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm doing this now, you know? Mm. And then like, it's kind of just like, okay, now what next? And developing like a menu for the next week. And then like that just kept happening. And then over time, over time, like the excitement kind of dies down a little bit Mm -hmm. with these types of subscriptions. But my mind was like, well, how else, what else, who else can I reach? How else can I reach more people? Um, And I, I saw another classmate who, who lived, moved back to, um, 
Oklahoma, mm. and she was doing um, markets, farmer's markets. And I was like, huh, well, maybe I should reach out to a farmer's market here and see if I could sell at the farmer's market. And then that eventually, like I did, um, at the time, the the market organization called Quesa, mm-hmm. now known as Foodwise. Okay. Um, they were running, they're the ones that run like the Saturday Ferry building market. Um, but they also have a seasonal market in the mission called Misha, um, Mission Mercado. Okay. And they run uh, March through November. And okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. Yep. Here, well, boom. Okay. We're back cool. back and, to normal. Um, back to normal. Um, yeah. And they run Mission Mercado, which I thought, well, that might be a good fit for me. You know, it's a smaller market. Right. It's the mission community. So there's a lot of Latino people there. Mm-hmm. And so maybe it's the right audience for me to be in. Um, and I reached out to them maybe towards the end of their season. Like it was like October and they end in November. And I said, this is, I remember like sending in my application saying, this is what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm making. Um, if you think I might be a right fit, like let me know. And I think they, because of COVID and it had shut down so many vendors, um, they needed vendors. They needed vendors. And I just happened to like show up right at the place, right time. Right place, right time, baby. Seriously. Love that. Yeah. And uh, and I showed up with like my table. I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, okay, now I have to make a menu, like a market menu. Mm-hmm. So it, made, it sort of like pushed me in creativity, creative, create, creatively to um, develop more of a market menu. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, what, did, what was different from that menu than the box? What was in the box? So the box always consists consisted of three staple things so it always had like a pair of chocolate chip cookies okay like my staple bread which is the concha which Mm -hmm. is like the classic mexican pan dulce and like a small bag of granola okay and then i would rotate in two sort of like pastry specials that i would just like you know be another pan dulce and like a another pastry or and i just kind of like kept like playing around being like okay this time this week i'm gonna try this new bread or this new pastry um but with a market or in general i think when you have like a coffee shop or a cafe you have to have like a set um simple menu and just be known for like you know you can show up to this place and you're always going to get like you know five to six things and it just be simple and consistent Mm -hmm. and like i was like okay that's what i gotta do like just come up with a menu and so i expanded a little bit what i wanted to bring and it kind of like it's fun right because then it gives you a challenge to be more creative and Mm. and also think about like well what will appeal to the audience and Mm. um yeah so it i brought in i think at the time maybe i had six items on the menu and Mm. i was like this is it like this is at capacity because i was baking from home (laughs) yeah i was gonna ask you that so when you did you sold your first 20 boxes yeah were you overwhelmed by how much space you needed oh yeah did you have to buy another fridge no no was your house like just my house was inundated (laughs) it was not and baking baking because you know bandul is a it's a kind of well bread in general like it it goes stale it dries Mm. out and you want everything fresh and you want it to still be edible by the time it makes it to your customer's doorstep so baking had to be only a couple hours ahead of when it was due so i was like on this crazy 24-hour schedule of baking bread and out of a tiny you know house oven yeah not like a commercial oven yeah. in in a kitchen where you can crank out. Like, yeah, that's where know. the true test comes because there's that moment yeah. where you're like, I'm never doing this again. Yes. Yeah, yeah it was <laughs> But nuts. the push through is why you're here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, Hell yeah. So, I mean, and I, I had the luxury of time. Like COVID just gave mm-hmm. us the luxury of time to. What were your kids doing while you were baking all this stuff? I mean, they're like eating it. Yeah, they're eating it and it's summertime. (laughs) So it's like, and we can't do anything except just either be inside or be way outside, like away from everyone else. Mm -hmm. So I had this luxury of time where the kids were free to do whatever they wanted. I was free to do whatever I wanted. I mean, within reason. But, but yeah, the like home, like the kitchen was like off limits. You're not allowed to like come into my kitchen. (laughs) And then, uh, like Friday nights and Saturday mornings were all like my dining table was just covered in boxes and covered in, in like trays of like, okay, everyone like pack up this round of cookies or pack up right. this round of whatever was going into the boxes. Little empleados right mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Little Dude, army of, <laughs> Hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, I mean, out here. That's why I had four kids. So yeah, you know, 
Do you want Jordans or not? <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Uh, um, so crazy story. Yeah. God damn. Yeah. And I didn't ask you this before, but what were you in college for? Like, what were you trying to do before all this? Um, so I studied art. Okay. And then uh, got married right out of college. Okay. And essentially, uh, I had this weird moment um, where I was applying to grad schools. I was trying to get into architecture school. Um, and right around the time I was not accepted into architecture school, I found out I was pregnant with my first child. Mm. And so I kind of just was like, okay, I guess I'm going this route right now. Mm -hmm. So I focused on having kids young and raising a family. And that's, that's where I was for the first sort of 14, 15 years of, mm -hmm. of my, how old were you? I was like mid twenties, 24, 25 when yeah. I started having kids. Um, and I just focused on that, mm -hmm. uh, did you think then that your life would change at all? Did you, or did you think like, this is it? This is like what I'm doing forever. The kids? With the kids, yeah. Um, or were you like, hey, I want your 20, I'll be free? I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, kids, having that many kids, it just becomes like a full time job yeah. in of itself. And I didn't, yes, I was thinking about some of like the time that you lose to like, career building mm -hmm. but at the same time like having kids was a choice I made and right. where I really did want to be focused um and yet at the same time I was like well you know you weren't that passionate about any design so it's okay right. to be like sort of sitting with the discomfort of not knowing what you want to do essentially like what do I want to be when I grow up mm -hmm. um and I think it wasn't until I was like the kids were my youngest was finally in school, maybe mm -hmm. he was in third grade that I said, everyone's old enough now that they don't need me at home in the way they needed me when they were younger. Mm -hmm. And I just, that itch of like always loving food, mm -hmm. always loving to cook. It's one of the ways I best express myself. Um, and just realizing like, why aren't you doing this already? Right. Um, and that's, that's what I can do it. <clears throat> just do it. Yeah. So yeah. the farmer's market, how many days a week are you there? The farmer's market at the mission yeah. is only on Thursdays. Okay. So it's once a week. Once a week, Once Thursday. a week, and it runs November through March. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, or March through November, actually. Uh, um, what do you fill in the off-season with? Um, in the off-season, actually, this, this year is a kind of a new, new sort of transition because typically I used to be at two markets, mm -hmm. one that ran year-round, mm -hmm. and the mission market, which ran seasonally. And I dropped that other year-round market um, so right now I'm kind of in this sort of ambiguous place where I'm trying to figure out like, uh, what do I do? You know, um, I'll, and my box subscription had closed for this past year. So I will likely be relaunching that in the new year, mm -hmm. return to doing like that Saturday delivery box. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities for pop-ups and other, other things like that with collaborating with some other my other friends who mm -hmm. I who are also in this sort of pop-up world who are the uh who are the friends we're talking about who we got <laughs> there is this uh woman who I worked with briefly we overlapped in NOPA mm -hmm. her name is Brenda Landa okay and she uh she's a private chef right now but she is doing occasional pop-ups with um there's a really good restaurant in the city wine bar called 20 spot mm-hmm and so she's been collaborating with them. Occasionally. That's cool. Yeah. So twenty spot. The twenty spot. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. So what's her what's her pop up concept called? Her pop up concept is called Good Bird. Okay, Good Bird. Good Bird. Dope. Yeah. yeah. Really cool person. Mm -hmm. Really great food. Uh, really interesting. You know, combination of her background. She's also of Mexican background, but she studied in Italy. Um, and also, you know, the California influence. So it's like all these different things coming together in mm -hmm. her menus. Really, really interesting. Damn. Speaking of Mexican culture, mm -hmm. we got to take it all the way back because okay. we're on Susio Talk. Okay. So where were you born? I was born in Mexico City. Born in Mexico City. Born, yeah, Chilanga. Chilanga. Yes. Okay. That's what, that's and what they call us. Um, when's the last time you were in Mexico City? Recently, yeah. actually. Recently, okay. Yeah, I was there this past week. How would you say things have changed over the time that you were born there until now? 
It's a different experience as an adult mm -hmm. going back because you get to see the city in a much more um, grown up way. Mm -hmm. But I'll have to say from the time I was young, even to the time that, you know, that I am now, uh, the city's always been like chock-a-block, like full of people, yeah. teeming with life. There's always street food, like tons of food everywhere yeah. you go. There's just riffraff um, everywhere. It's a beautiful city yeah. and it's always it been super vibrant. Um, I just feel like now it has way more play in in sort of, I don't know if it has to do with social media mm. or, you know, campaigning better better sort of marketing right. for the city. But it's always been that good. I think it's always been that right. good. Yeah. And it's just, I feel like Mexican food has just been elevated to like, uh, it's, it's no longer just seen as like, oh, it's just tacos and burritos, you know, yeah. it's elevated. You're right. Um, so I think it's just in our eyes more mm -hmm. and it has a, I would say it has a more louder sort of reputation, but it's always been there. When you were growing up, um, was it always uh, like a, how'd you get to the States, basically? Was it always like a thing, like I'm going to live in the States when I'm older? Or were you like, I'm going to stay in Mexico City my yeah, whole life? Yeah, so we, you know, I was so young when we moved to the States. Mm -hmm. I was five. Um, my dad worked at a company that was opening a satellite office, essentially, in, nope. in Miami. So, yeah, so that's how we wound up in Miami. Just kind of random, you know, this Mex there's not a huge Mexican um, community in Mexico or mm. sorry, in Miami. There's a huge um, Cuban community. Puerto Ricanos. Yeah, Puerto Ricanos, yeah. Dominicanos, like a lot of South American countries, but not a huge Mexican community there. Mm. And so, um, yeah, there wasn't just a lot of culture to like, like to, to like hold on to. Mm -hmm. Um, but we returned every summer. We would, my dad and mom would drive us from Miami all the way to Mexico City every summer. How long is that drive? It's like a four to five drive, four to five day drive. Four to five days. What were you staying in, like Motel Sixes yeah. along the way? Yeah, we would. My dad was That's crazy. That's an adventure. That's awesome. My dad would drive, like avid driver would drive, like you know, the stretch of Florida. We'd we'd get to like Mobile, Alabama, crash for the night somewhere. And then continue on to like Texas where we had family mm -hmm. and like, you know, take a break in Texas for like a day or two and then continue into, I think we'd cross the border, maybe stay with another family or like a hotel. Yeah. And then eventually like make, make our way all the way into the city. That's crazy. Yeah. It is crazy. And dad. it's just like, we just did it. Good for dad. dad Hell yeah. yeah. Mom and dad were crazy. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Like, did you find, like, since you did it so much, did you find you guys staying at, like, the same hotels after a while? Or was it always, like, a different hotel, a different town? Um, I feel like we always stopped in Mobile, Alabama. That's, like, the place. Yeah. Any and diners there that you remember? Any, like, no, places I don't, weird? No, I don't really remember the food. I, I, you know, it it would not surprise me if my mom just had a cooler packed with yeah, like, right. like <laughs> oranges and apples and like sandwiches and like, you know, just tossing back. Like, this is That's what right. you're eating. We're just driving like, nonstop. Man, we just need three days worth we of just food. Need That's to, it. We just need to get there. Yeah, that's it. And then that's it. And I think really the times we would stop were in Dallas, which mm -hmm. is where we have family. I do remember stopping there. And like, I have a cousin who was born and raised in, in Dallas and uh, like just e eating Southern Texan food. Mm -hmm. like I learned all about okra, fried okra there, you know, and like just hush puppies and, you know, Texan food. Right. Barbecue. Yeah. So I have, I have food memories connected to, to Dallas. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about it. I think we would just drive straight. <laughs> nuts. It's that's just, crazy. it's nuts. When I think about it, when you think about it as an adult, you're just like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, like you're like, I'd never do that. Mm -mm. Never even think about doing no. that with no, like, <clears throat> Just with a map, like just the first yes. time he did it, just like figuring it out. That's right. Like yeah. just take out the big atlas and be like, okay, I guess you go up I-95. and Dude, like I can't even get over. to the fucking corner store without putting the map in. Right? I'm like, yeah, we're so we're so used to our Google Maps. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's crazy. And it like suggests shit for you too. Yeah, you don't have to think. You're like, hey, your parked car is over here. I'm like, I didn't even yeah. tell you to do You're that. You're never lost. You. Yeah. yeah crazy someone mm -hmm. was telling me the other day about he was like uh 
telling me about direction and north and east mm-hmm. and west. And I'm like, man, as far as I'm concerned, wherever I'm looking is north. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Are I'm you, like, are you never like, oriented? <laughs> you, you know, never I'm know. never oriented. I, I'm, I haven't been oriented since birth. Like, I don't know where the fuck north is or That's east so is. That's so funny. Like, I don't think about it. I'm just like, and you oh, don't have to. I'm just like, yeah, you yeah. know, it's one less ignorance is bliss. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it I'm works, just like, it hey, works. Don't, as far as don't I'm knock it. concerned, this way is north. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are a lot of cultures that don't um, don't orient themselves, you oh, know. Oh, really? Yeah. Or like the way they orient themselves is not necessarily um, related to directional. It's like either it's time based or. Whoa. I, I don't know a whole lot of it, so I'm not going to like. You know, tell everyone here tell, on Susio Talk. Yeah, I'm like I'm an expert on. <laughs> You're an expert. <laughs> yeah, on top of making pan dulce, I'm yeah. a navigational expert. I also listen to History Channel while yeah. I make your pan dulce. <laughs> so pan dulce recipe. recipe. Talk me through it. Like, what's the method? What makes that bread different than regular ass bread? So, you know, I think it's a very simple bread. Mm-hmm. It's a pan dulce has this history in Mexico from way back. It has it has to do with when wheat was introduced into the Mexican culture because before before wheat was introduced, it was an all masa based culture, corn based. All corn. All corn. Um and it kinda has like this wheat has this ugly beginning, right? Because it's brought in by Spanish colonizers. Yeah, for and sure. And it's like Hey, this is what we're paying you with. Like, not only are we taking over your like, your land, like shit. and they're like, we're paying you with wheat. And so there was this sort of distaste for it because right. it's like, well, we don't like this, and you're paying us with it. So, like, kind of, no what thanks, the fuck, man. No, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Uh, and then over time, like you know, over time as like, as Mexico becomes sort of inundated with different colonizers like the Spanish came in, the French came in, the Austrian came in. Um, they get exposure to French, Austrian, European essentially style breads. And by that time, you know, sugar has been introduced to the, to essentially like the process of bread making, Mm -hmm. which makes it way more palatable to the, anything with sugar is Mm -hmm. better. Um, so over time, like this evolves into pan dulce and Mexico's version of it. And now like it's pan dulce is ubiquitous with like Mexican culture. Like you walk into a panaderia and you just, you don't think colonizers or, <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, you just think this is Mexican. <laughs> You're like, um, you know what? This bakery screams colonizer. Right. <laughs> but, but at the same time, it's like, it, it has come from that, right. from that history. Yeah. But it's sometimes it's, I, I'm like, there's a dangerous question that I ask myself and I'm like, is, is the evil necessary hmm. for the things to happen hmm. that we like, that we like, right. like innovation, whatever. There's sure. like a little bit of bad in every good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I guess in this, in this case, you it, could say like it, it didn't, oh, it didn't start. Right. It wasn't it the best. Like they wasn't. weren't like. Hey, we're paying you with wheat because in, you know, 300, 400 yeah. years, you guys are going to make pan dulce out of it. It's going to be bomb. Right. It's yeah. like you guys are going to no, take no, over. No it's going to be dope. Yeah. <laughs> no. I hear, I've been looking at a lot of uh, recent things that just come up on social mm-hmm. media. And then I, you know, watch some YouTube videos about how Spanish people used to stink back in the day. And you okay. could smell them. Uh-huh. You could smell them coming. Interesting. And, and the natives would be like, yo, son, take a shower. Like, you oh, need to wow. shower. And it'd be like, and yeah. I guess the dirtiest motherfucker was like the coolest. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, kind of crazy. That. Yeah, I did not you know, know that. I could be wrong. Someone no. fact check me. Yeah. Where are your fact checkers? 50 people that listen to this show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You thought you were going to get more publicity. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um... <laughs> Or were we? Pan dulce. Pan dulce. So the recipe. Um, It is essentially a brioche style bread. Mm -hmm. And brioche um, is this delicious, like fluffy bread, Mm -hmm. highly enriched bread. So when we say enriched, we mean butter and eggs and like all the fats, right? Um, Tricky. It can be tricky, but it's actually... Is it wet? It's really wet dough. It's a... Not a wet dough. 
I would describe it as like a very elastic right. and um, sometimes sticky dough. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's beautiful to work with. Um, it's one of like these tactile things that I really love working with dough. It's like over time, I'm like, oh, dough and I have a relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, it talks to you. You got to know how it behaves. Yeah. You got to treat it right. It's like a teenager. Yeah. Yeah. You have to like really like know how to work it with your hands mm-hmm. and like watch it, you know, when it, when it's rising and if the yeast isn't working, you have to like figure that out. Like there's all these like little things that you learn technically as a baker, but then mm-hmm. over time with tact- like tactile hands-on experience, you also learn what it should feel like. Um, and how it should behave, like when it's ha- when it's at its happiest, mm-hmm. essentially. Um, but the recipe, the recipe that I use is a brioche style bread. Um, I think a lot of places use masa madre, like sourdough, okay, um, which makes it more airy, you know, more fluff. My my recipe is a little bit more, um, a little more dense, okay. Uh, and I use butter, creamy. Yeah, so I think a lot of the Typically, that's pan, the best pan dulce. You don't want no cr- no crumbly pan dulce. No, and you want. I mean, I personally, I want that butter feel. Yeah, I want that rich flavor. Um, I think traditionally, due to costs, uh, a lot of like large scale bakeries, even in Mexico, use uh, manteca, mm-hmm. which is just widely available. It's a cheaper ingredient, but it does lack like the flavor shortening. Yeah, shortening vegetable shortening. Mm-hmm. Maybe some places use lard, um, but what I've seen is manteca, and like not not dissing manteca because I also use it in different capacities. Mm-hmm. But for bread and like for like the staple, like the bulk of my baked products, I will use butter because butter just tastes better. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, my brioche, my pan dulce is a brioche style bread. But I try to. I really do try to keep it simple, mm-hmm. um, because ultimately, what's shining through and like what I want to connect with is like the simplicity of the food. It's using good ingredients and then just like bringing that to the community. Mm. And then, apart from the <coughs> farmers market, where else are you? So right now, I am working with uh, Nopalito, mm-hmm. uh, the Mexican restaurant in San Francisco. Um, they're sort of like my family in terms of like who I work with. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're the ones that kind of like gave me the space that I work, like that I'm working in now. Mm-hmm. Not kind of, they, they, you know, <laughs> they're fucking doing it. They're doing it. Who's the chef they're doing there? It. Uh, chef Gonzalo. Okay. Um, he's amazing. And their team is amazing. And I love, I love them like family. Uh, yeah, and they essentially when they, when the co-owner there saw, like found me at the farmer's market, she was like, what are you doing? And I said, this is what I'm doing. She happened to also be co-owner at NOPA yeah. at the time. Um, and she was like, come to Nopalito, we have space for you. And so I took, I took them up on that offer and like kind of just stayed. <laughs> uh, so Nopalito is like sort of my home base. Um they carry some of my bread there, so that's really great. That's one of my sort of sale avenues. Um, and then Grand Coffee on Mission Street. Okay. Uh, they're a coffee shop. They have two locations. The original one is, like, right on 20th and Mission. And then, like, the newer shop opened up right by the Alamo um draft house draft house oh, okay there's, there's a cute okay. little coffee shop right next to it called yeah. grand coffee too who are the owners who um are so that's co-owned by three owners okay um nabil kim and adrian mm-hmm. uh super fascinating people like nabil is of palestinian background adrian is mexican-american mm-hmm. and kim is korean-american mm-hmm. um and so they all, yeah that's Amaz- cool. amazing group of people humans wonderful people and um i don't even know how they found like how we found each other i think one of them came through the mission market because the mission market is like literally behind like it's like right around the corner from their Mm. spot and they they found me and they're like wow we'd love to have some of your pastries in our shop and i kind of said oh okay yeah i 
Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, so you can find your pastries there mm-hmm. all the time. Um, not all the time, but Mondays and Wednesdays. Mondays and Wednesdays. Mondays okay. and Wednesdays, I'm dropping off at Grand Coffee, mm. and then at Nopalito, it's weekly, like daily. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Do you also do the bread for like their savory like bread butter? For Nopalito? Yeah. No, no, they they have their own. Um, they don't they don't do like bread for the table, mm-hmm. but they do have like uh, sandwiches that they make for their takeout window that okay. they have their own bread for them. All right, yeah. right, right, right. Very so cool. I just yeah, I gotta just check take, out these spots. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't been to Nopalito, I highly recommend it. Okay. And also Grand Coffee's coffee is amazing. Okay. Grand Coffee, Nopalito. Mm-hmm. I'm coming. Mm-hmm. Coming for you. Yeah. Should be a Sucio Talk promo code. You should. You should go check well. <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know how to get you the promo code. Hey but. chef, I'll I'll work on it on my own. But I'm thinking <laughs> that we if I if you go to a restaurant, and you listen to the show, you say Susio sent me. Yeah. Five percent off your bill. Boom. There you go. Boom. There you go. Wear the t shirt. Yeah, exactly. Um I know I could make it work. Um, okay. So no palito, you're there. How many days a week are you working? Seven days uh, a week? I was for a long time. Like sort you of You got just, employees now? Um kind of. Kind of. Little, kind like, of like Chef. like like half t- like part time employees. Okay. Yeah. What do we? Who do you got? Um. You know, I work. I I like to say I work with people, not like people don't work right. for me because because it is a collaborative team effort. Mm-hmm. Um. But I have Salasi Dochi working okay. w- alongside with me on some days. Salasi uh, recommended uh, you to this podcast. Yes. So shout out to her. Yeah. Shout out to Salasi. Um, yeah. Love that person. They're they're doing amazing stuff with their food. As well. Um, and then this woman who I met through Nopalito, uh, she was their main sort of salsa maker mm-hmm. and was looking for, you know, more work. And she was recommended to me. And so I started working with her. Um, and yes, just solid, solid people to work with. Hell yeah. So how are you forecasting your needs for how busy you are? Like, do you know more or less how much you're going to sell? Are you over or under? Are you kind of, you know? Um, it depends for, like, for instance, for market. Mm-hmm. Like, I have set pars. Mm-hmm. I have an idea of what sells at the market. So that's that's just, like, steady. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, I feel like now it's so steady that, like, for instance, this past season, I brought on two new items. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's nice to be in this place where you can be, like, I'm going to introduce a new, introduce to the community, a new cake and like, just see how it sells Mm -hmm. and just sort of have like, they have enough confidence or they like your stuff enough that you can confidently bring something new to the market and people will buy it Mm -hmm. because they're like, well, I like your other stuff. So I'm trusting that this is going to be good too, or good for me. Um, Yeah. And so like, my sales for a market like have been consistent, mm-hmm. although kind of wacky in some ways, but consistent. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, I think you did. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Right away. I want to know what the farmers market tax is. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. You know, I I kind of just give is out it by contract, or like, do you pay for the stand? Oh, you mean with the with the organization? Yeah. Um, so food wise. Depending on the kind of seller you are, you have to apply for um, permits, mm-hmm. but they they sort of guide you through the- guide you through it and do it for you. Mm-hmm. So you pay you pay them a fee, a quarterly fee. So for if if Foodwise or if Mission Market was open for four seasons, the four quarters mm-hmm. of the year, then every quarter I would be paying the the city fee for running a what would be called like a temporary food facility. Mm-hmm. Um, but it depends on the kind of seller you are. So me sort of being in this strange niche where I don't have my own commercial kitchen, but I'm operating out of a commercial kitchen. I fall under this temporary food facility category, mm-hmm. which covers me sort of legally with the city to operate out of the commercial kitchen and sell at the farmer's market. Gotcha. Um, but I also carry a cottage food industry, like a CFO is what they're called, mm-hmm. um, which allows me to still sort of operate from home, which I don't really do at this point. Um, but it just covers me in case anything were to happen where like emergency, I need to work from home, you know? Right. Uh, so you have to get a certification now to cook from home. 
Yeah, the cottage food industry. That's how most people were doing it, especially during COVID when there right. wasn't access to mm -hmm. uh, commercial kitchens. Um, it, Damn. Yeah, the cottage food industry blew up during COVID for I sure. know that there's a lot of places on DoorDash yeah. that you can order from and it's like people's houses. I'm sure there's that and there's like the ghost kitchens. I don't know how they operate, but there are a lot of ghost kitchens and sort of <clears throat> these satellite kitchens where you can rent for a day or two or... I don't know, um, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure what the a sort day or two. Yeah, I think you can like that's crazy. Tap into that, um, tap into that sort of network of ghost kitchens, or like you know maybe only rent it out a day or two every week. Right. Right. You're a tenant at this location for only a set amount of time. Whoa. Yeah, but I don't know the process, the permitting process for that. Like what, what is required? I'm mm -hmm. very like specific. Like, I know what I need for the farmer's market. Um, right. And then Food Wise does charge you for, like, the, you know, the stall. Right. And that's... Oh, because they set up the tents. Um, we set up our own tents, mm. but, you know, you're you're paying for the space, like, the little square, the 10 okay. by 10 square, essentially, that you get. So, mm. yeah. So, they're landlords. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> food Shout wise, out to Food Wise. Yeah. We love Shout you. out we to love Food you. Wise. We love I you. love Food Wise. We love you. Yes. Um... <laughs> I never, I never did really a farmer's market. I did do a taco cart a couple times. Yeah. Have you um, been to the markets in the city? Not, not over here. Not the one that, that you're talking about, the Mission Mercado. Mission Mercado is beautiful. Yeah. Um, the, community, the community there is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, love, I love what FoodWise is doing in the Mission. Um, I love what they do here at the Ferry Building. Uh, but it's a different vibe, different community. You get mm -hmm. a lot more... I would say tourist traffic at the ferry building just because it is like a, you know, a gathering spot for San Francisco and it's, it's like an icon, mm -hmm. you know? Um, <clears throat> so if you're ever selling at the Saturday ferry, ferry building, you're just going to get a lot of passerbys um, who kind of like, Oh, what's that? You know? But when you're at the mission market, people are like, I'm coming here for my pan dulce. I'm coming here for my masa. I'm coming here for like, my fruit from this vendor or mm -hmm. my strawberries from this you have loyal customers you there. have like set customers you know and then occasionally you get like a random person that's like oh what what is this you know and yeah. they're like well this is what this is and they're like oh my god i've never seen this before um so you get to like have those interactions as well where you're introducing what you do to somebody new and that's mm -hmm. that's always nice too but i i feel like i feel way more at home at the mission market than than that than when i've popped up at um, the Saturday Ferry Building. It's just such a much larger. I think you have to be a consistent vendor to get that, right? That consistent uh, customer base. Whoa, that's crazy. Uh, do you? Th it might be that not the same people go to every market. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it definitely t you tap into different yeah. communities in the city. I think when you live in <clears throat> Oakland, the city seems small to me. Mm hmm. Like, I'm not like, but when you're in it, you're like, man, I got to go all the way to Embarcadero. Right. When you're in the right. mission, you're like, fuck that. Yeah, it's like, they're like little yeah. villages. All yeah, but when I'm when I'm here and I'm like, fuck, got to drive over there, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, huh. And even when you're in, in the city, if I'm driving, mm -hmm. no problem. I don't like, it's 10 minutes. Right. You know, it's, right. I think just people can't do it. Yeah. It is dangerous. Driving in that city, really? Or people go, people go crazy. Well, you know, you were driving. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I'm used to it. I don't know. I'm used <laughs> to the crazy. She's drivers. just immune. Yeah, I'm like, like yeah. I'm, cu I'm curious what kind of crazy driving you've seen that that you find. I scary. mean, you see the sideshow shit, and then um, I just see a lot of close calls. You know, people okay. like people like just running. The red light. Uh -huh. And I'm just like, oh! Yeah. You know, and I'm horrified for yes. like five minutes. Yeah. I'm like... <sighs> You're like trauma. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm like, yo, that could end I, so badly. I will say this. I, I, I tend to be... I think I, I'm pretty good at navigating in general, mm -hmm. but uh, I remember just hearing a lot of... There are a lot of one ways. There's a lot of... You can only be... This is like a left turn lane only. Like all these things that... I think over time, as a local driver, you just learn. Uh, and, yeah. What's going on? Good. I need to sit up. Sorry. 
Okay. There we go. Okay. The bar was just like across your face. Yeah. yeah. But it's okay. Nobody watches this, so it's fine. <laughs> Um, um, especially now, I mean, look, it's a lot expected people to watch like an hour of something sure. like this. Yeah, it's true. Like, I did a podcast once was three hours. Your uh, own podcast? Yeah. This one. I, yeah. I did one. I was in like North Carolina or some uh -huh. shit and somebody was like, Lord of the Rings. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. Lord of the Rings. Yeah, that's a long, literally a three hour movie. Oppenheimer. And this podcast. <laughs> yeah. This podcast is the same length. I'm like. Nobody's gonna listen to this. No one's gonna sit and like listen to me talk about uh, navigation. Yeah, in the city. literally, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Fucking That's nuts. That's funny. Uh, so, do you want a restaurant? Do you want a brick and mortar bakery? I do. Okay, I do. Where I would think, you put it? Um, I think it would be amazing to be able to be in the mission mm -hmm. to kind of, I don't know, like the last this past year, I've been able to, I've been lucky enough to be able to travel to Mexico City twice. I'm like, the city is so, um, Mexico City is so vibrant. Mm -hmm. There's this pulse. I'm like, wouldn't it be so amazing to be able to somehow like regenerate this energy and bring it to the mission mm -hmm. and like have this community space where, I don't know, like, you know, we can, we can be making bread for the community and like, I don't know, just like this open space for, for everyone that, that I find to be my regulars. Mm -hmm. um, Would you do classes? That's a good question. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be, I think it'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. Come learn how you to make. Can, you can be one of those panaderas on YouTube. Yeah. Come learn how to make conchas with me. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Concha, concha workshops. There you go. Yeah. TikTok workshops. Yeah. There you go. You got to do all um, that. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, I do like to teach. Um, I think it's a good way to, Get the community <clears throat> involved, and you could do it at the farmers market. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I done. Uh, I did one. I did like ribs or something. Did you? Yeah, in the live same. in the. Yeah. Like while you were selling. Yeah. Okay. No, I wasn't selling. It okay. was like a restaurant. I was at. I was with the Charter Oak, and they're like, "You got to go do this presentation at the farmers market." Okay. Yeah. So we like brought some stuff and we like right. grilled and. We okay. Like, Here you go. This is how you make this. Yeah, I did it over the summer, or actually. Late summer, I did a little food demo at the at Foodwise at the Ferry Building. Yeah, that was fun. But there was a lot of like prep, you know, leading up to it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't you can't bake bread on site because it just takes time. Um, but you I had get yourself one of those little ovens. When I, you just hitch the back of your car, right? <laughs> like like one of those super hot ovens, like yeah. pizza ovens. <laughs> exactly, pizza oven. Put in the back a little, yeah. like a little trailer. Yeah, little flatbreads. Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, so, but I brought, like, bolillos, which mm -hmm. are Mexicans, like, our, our version of a baguette. They're, like, little football-shaped breads. Um, bolillos. Yeah, bolillos. Yeah, bolillos means, well, in, in Puerto Rico Spanish, uh, cigarette butts. Oh, really? Bolillos, yeah. Oh, interesting. No tiene los bolillos ahí. Don't worry. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. It's like the same language, but different. I same, know. but different. So many different. And there's so much, honestly, having grown up in the States and sort of been far away from my culture, there's so much that I'm constantly like learning. Like I'll be in the kitchen with um, Gonzalo mm -hmm. from Nopalito and he'll throw out like a saying and I'm just like, Phew. yeah. And he's like, ay, Raquel. Like, you're not Mexican. <laughs> Forgive me. Like I have like, I'm straddling both cultures, you know, yeah. like I, I've got a, like, it's like this. It's like you're thinking in Spanish, yeah. talking in English or yeah. vice or versa. Vice versa. Yeah. Yes. And you're like, yeah, so it's hard. Yeah. When, um, I feel like there's like this, this interesting, and maybe there's more of us now, but it's like, you know, you hear a lot, a lot of like, neither, neither aquí, neither allá. Yeah. You know, and how there's so many of us now who either were born in our respective countries but then raised in the states yep. but then had like really close ties to where we grew up but we're also like being raised with like the americana culture and you know like still exposed to our own culture and it's like you're bridging these two cultures and and it, it just makes for a unique experience as a person mm -hmm. um but also like you there's like a lot lost in translation and a lot lost in in the sense of what the knowledge that you could gain from like be f fully immersed in one in one spot you mm -hmm. know 
For sure. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's a blessing. You know, when I was born in Puerto Rico, raised in Connecticut, mm -hmm. completely different places. Totally. But you're like, you know, Miami experience, though, that's that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Going to school in Miami. Yeah. It's always hot. hot. What were you doing, like, weekends hanging out with friends? I mean. In high school and stuff Yeah, in you spend a lot of time at the beach. You're just going to the beach. You're going to the beach. Come on. You can't beat that. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, the beach is amazing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, and even as a child, like, my parents would pack us into the car. We'd drive by, like, the little market that had, like, the delicious Cuban mm -hmm. sandwiches and buy a bunch of Cuban sandwiches and, like, pack them to the beach. Hell and, like, yeah. Spend a day at the beach eating a bunch of, like, Cuban sandwiches. Mm -hmm. Either like the classic Cubano or pan con bistec. Like those are things that are like nostalgia inducing for me, but mm. also they're freaking delicious. Do you think you'd ever move back to Florida? Miami? No. Do you have family there still? No, I don't have family anymore there. No, My parents gone. moved. Um, they moved away from uh, Miami. So. Got it. Miami don't, I don't have a home base there anymore. Like family wise. Yeah, so you're like, whatever. Any yeah. friends? I or? have friends there. Yeah. yeah, like a lot of my, my high school friends are. are but your life there. is here now or you're staying here? Life is here. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, life is here. This is home. I feel like m San Francisco is where I feel the most connected to like my culture in some way. I would say um, that it's kind <clears> of <throat> like a second Mexico City. Yeah. It could feel like that in some neighborhoods. Yeah. Just the, the energy sometimes mm -hmm. is like that. Yeah, I feel like, okay, so I grew up in Miami, um, highly exposed to Cuban culture, like other Lat Latin cultures, mm -hmm. not a whole lot of exposure of my own. And then I went to school in the Northeast, um, which is a complete different culture uh, and still also sort of feeling othered in that way where yeah. where you're just not seeing a lot of your, your own self. Um and then eventually making my way out here to California. And then this is where I'm like, oh, here are the Mexicans. Here is mm -hmm. this culture that like, I've been longing for all this time. You know, um, there's so much diversity here. It, it just feels like you don't feel like you stand out as much because there's just so much more. There's so many more minorities than I had been exposed to, I think. Well, in college, I guess. Right. It does feel nice to blend in. It's nice. And it's also <laughs> nice to like, it's just nice to experience like other cultures that you can relate to. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I mean, I think you can generally find connection with any culture. Um, but there is something about like Mexican culture and like the family base. And like, you see that like resonating in other, other cultures. So mm. it's just nice to, to experience that. Um, out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think also like for me, that's the Mexican community here. It's like just hearing, hearing your own accent, yeah. you know, like that's, <laughs> that's freaking awesome. Hell yeah. It's, it's nice. You know where I was just at? I was at a uh, Hobosh in Mexico. Where? I don't know Hobosh. It's uh two hours off the coast of Cancun. Okay. No, I mean, it takes two hours to get there, but it's like a little island off Cancun. It was, oh, it was wow. so dope. It was, wow. it was amazing. It was uh, apparently there's no rock on the island. It's all okay. soft sand. Okay. So when the tide came up, like the, all the streets flooded. Oh, wow. And you had to take like a dune buggy to get to places. What? It was fucking sick. What brought you there? Oh, my girl was uh, okay. celebrating my new job. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. How fun. So I did that. It was fun. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I don't know about that place, but. Yeah. I was like, how did you find this? Mm -hmm. You know, so I was like, hey, you found it. You know? That's awesome. Um, new chef at OpenAI, by the way. Oh. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, I just can't. Just dropping it I just in. can't believe it because it, you know I'm not a corporate person. Sure. I've never been. Yeah. And I'm like the executive chef of OpenAI. Yeah. This, this like app tech company, and I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Here? Tell me about. I that. was like, I'm just like, pinch me. Is this real? I like spent a couple of days at Google. Mm -hmm. Yo, they got a DeLorean meeting room. Wait, what? Like a like a Back to the Future car. Okay, but it's inside the room, it, or the in, room is in, made to look it's like it's inside. Delorean. Okay. The thing, the car is there, and it's a meeting room. Okay. You so can you, like sit in you there go and have a meeting. The yeah. Car and like look at the flux capacitor. Have a, yeah, literally, <laughs> it 
the replica. That's I'll show you pictures. It's fucking nuts. That's nuts. And the incentive behind that is that it's just I, it's just cool. I yeah. don't know. Does I it mean, help with like does it help with employee honestly, productivity? Honestly, everyone there is smiling. Yeah. Yeah. How could you not? Not one person there is like, mm, I'm so stressed out. Yeah. They're all like how? Yeah, like I'm Marty McFly. Oh, shit, yeah. fucking food is free. I'm like, damn. Yeah, they've got it good there, it sounds like. Hell yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yo, where was this my whole life? Right. So if you're struggling. Did you grow up in that, like, in that era of, like, Back to the Future and um, that kind of. Yeah, um, 90s, <clears throat> early 90s, uh, late, late 80s. Like, even though the first one, I think, was, like, 84 or something. Yeah, yeah. First one was early. Uh-huh. Uh, but, no, my dad, so in Puerto Rico, there's this town called Lajas, and in Lajas there is a gas station slash movie rental place. Okay. And it's old school movie rentals with like the VHS with yes. the foam. Still to this day. Wow. Like some DVDs, but mainly VHS. Yeah. And so my dad used to like old horror movies. Uh -huh. So we used to watch like Dracula, but we also used to watch this old Mexican wrestler called Santos. Okay. And he had movies with like Santos versus werewolf, Santos versus Dracula. And at the end of every movie, they would end up on this cliff and Santos would oh like God. push, push the person push, off or whatever. Yeah. And off? be like, ah, oh. yeah, like, you know, yeah. Every, every, every movie ended up like a pit at the edge of hell. Oh, Cause it was wow. always like fire and then a pit. <laughs> but yeah, I always remember Santos, but yeah, that, Santos. that oh VHS God, place. That up. But that's amazing. So, VHS and it, but how many households still have VHS? Yeah, I don't think players? any. Like, because there's yeah. a lot of uh, lost family footage mm -hmm. that I feel like needs to be recovered. Just a lot of families got that little camcorder, yeah. and you know, 1995. Just like, yes, yeah, I know I got a bunch of it. Uh -huh. You know, interesting. Yeah, fascinating. Santos, I'm gonna have to look that up. See? Yeah, check it out, Santos. See, like, these are like bits of my culture that I'm always yeah, like, yeah. Oh, learning new things. The lucha libre is I important. Totally. You know? Yeah, it's such you a... You got Rey Mysterio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. his son is now a wrestler. Uh -huh. Dominic. Yeah. Do yep. you follow this? I don't follow lucha libre. <laughs> How do you know? But I've heard of it. Mister. Yeah. yeah. I've heard of like the name is, but I haven't really like, you know, gone to see it. We were, we were, I was in Mexico City recently, but it was such a large family gathering. We were there for my parents um, celebrating their wedding anniversary. Mm -hmm. And so it was a like, What know, wedding anniversary? What year? 50th. 50. 50 years together. Damn, they yeah. don't make them like that no more. No, no, no. It's special. <laughs> it's special. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I had a set of cousins yeah. who, who went to Lucha Libre, but there was just so many of us and we were all like, sort of like, you know, Divided yeah, you're in the mix. Like, Plus, they probably got you bacon. Like, no, I, I didn't have to bake. Okay. I didn't have to bake. <laughs> okay, but but it's just there was so much activity. That I didn't get a chance to like mm -hmm. find out like what everyone else was doing, and then I found out later that a bunch of them had gone. They had to, gone to the lucha. Yeah, and I was like, oh, that would have been fun. That shit's to go. good. I mean, they come here. They come here sometimes. Yeah, they're here, and um, there's a local organization that that does a fundraiser like once a year. Um, and they do lucha at the fundraiser. They do lucha at the fundraiser. That's dope. Yeah. And I think it's either in the Mission or like Cow Palace or somewhere where they mm -hmm. hold, it, hold it. But it's... The Cow Palace is a wild place. Yeah. I cooked there. Really? Yeah. I helped this... Uh, was it like a large caterer event? Caterer was an event. Yeah. Okay. It was a rodeo. Yes. I've heard of yeah, that rodeo. Yeah, it was a rodeo and it was fucking crazy. Cow Palace. It was like 3,000 people. Yeah. Just hungry as fuck. <sighs> And uh, crazy new kitchen uh -huh. build out. Okay. Like new dishwasher, brand new. We were the first ones to use it. So was that nice? Like that was, was that good? Or it was, was really it? nice. Okay. It was like really spacious room. Right. Like, but still cooking at that large scale. Is uh, I mean, it's it was kind of easy too because it's like it's just pulled pork sandwiches. Okay. So at the end of the day, like the sauce and the meat is there, and there it's not like a nice. I mean. It wasn't bad, but I'm just saying, like, right. there's no it's pickles like, on it's it. Like there's fast no, food. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you're like. So it's just fucking, assembly. But yeah, it's yeah, a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's work. I was doing this thing where I was just saying yes to everything. Yeah. And then you end up doing some things where you're like, where the fuck are we? What am I doing? Yeah, because I looked out from that back room, the kitchen back room, and uh -huh. there was just like sleeping show pigs. 
Yeah. Or like the whole room was full of <laughs> sleeping like, show pigs. Like, how did I yeah. wind up here with? They legitimately like show them, and they're like these huge, muscular ass pigs that are just are like, fucking. What? It's crazy. They walk them. Yeah. And, like they show them, and people are like so pumped. And it's just for show. It's just for show. That's they're it. not. They're not being. Um, uh, after a while, they get slaughtered. But like they're just for show, and there's families out back camping, right? Like, just like with their pig. Yeah, that's it's what a they huge do. Huge thing. That's a, it's like such a niche. I just never understood it. Yeah. I never, I never looked at a farm animal. and was like, damn, look at that farm animal. There, that it's like, um, I bet you there's a documentary about that, right? But there's like a documentary about like show chickens. Yeah, there is. And uh, I haven't seen it, but I've heard of it. Um, show chickens yeah like all the different like beautiful like you know whatever crested chickens or Mm -hmm. and how they're bred and like how they're like which ones show better and how they i don't know it was like um i heard about it listening to another podcast that reviews documentaries Mm -hmm. um but it's a comedy podcast so okay what's it called uh cheryl and tig true story Okay, is it Tig Notaro? Yes. Okay, got yeah. you, got yeah. you. So, like, she she and her best friend will, like, commit to watching a documentary, mm-hmm. and then they review it, but half the time they're just, like, not talking about it. Right. <laughs> but then they, they inadvertently, like, of course it's Tig, so it's going to be hilarious, yeah. like, the commentary. Then they circle um, back. They circle back, circle. but they essentially cover the basic... Like, this is the gist of this documentary, mm-hmm. and this is what we loved, and this is what's weird about it, and this is what's whatever. So I learned a lot about <laughs> documentaries, but I remember hearing about the, the chicken documentary. Damn. Chicken. I've been to a cockfight before. I have not. That shit's crazy. Yeah. They're like, uh, they got this little, like, thing they put on their claw before they, they go at it. Uh-huh. It's like a glove. It's crazy. It's Wait, like the, the chicken's got a glove? Cl- yeah, the chicken has, like, a, oh. a, like a protective... Where, thing on its claw. Where was this? Puerto uh, Rico. Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was like normal when yeah. I was a kid. When I was a kid. Now it's like, no, you can't do that. It's shit. illegal in Puerto Rico. I think it was, it was illegal then too, I think, but people don't give a fuck kind of. Yeah. You know? It's not yeah. like, you know, yeah. especially the cops. I mean, what? they don't care, <laughs> you know. Um, hey, you don't get paid enough to care sometimes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, there's probably... Bigger things to worry about. Larger fish to fry. Exactly. Exactly. Like, fine, these people are going to have fun at a fruit cockfight. Then That's it. very true. Like, they're not harming anyone, right? Yeah. Well, maybe the chickens are being harmed. <laughs> but, but if it's, like, containing a group of people that otherwise might be out causing trouble. Right. Like, then why not? Then why That's not? why I say, let the sideshows go. Kind of. You know? Yeah. Just don't do it on the Bay Bridge. Uh, yeah. Like, that's step. I mean, come on, man. People got to get to work. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've never seen one. I hear them every now and then because I live in a neighborhood where I'm not too far from Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. Um, you hear a lot about, like, this happened on Twin Peaks and, you know. Or there are intersections near where I live where you can just see, like, the, the donut the, marks. The donut marks. Yeah. And you're like, all right. Hey, it's people having fun. People are having fun. I just, sometimes I see them crash and I'm like, I don't think that I would put my tires in my car in that kind of danger for just like, for, that, for nothing, for that, nothing. But that's what they do though, right? Because nobody's like, like, good job. Do you think there's like a king? Like, like a person that's really good at it? There must be. The hierarchy there, of. There like, must be, right? Damn. Like. Um, Think in ten years are going to be in the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really weird. Yeah, it would um, be. Who knows? But you, you never know. You never really you know. You never know. Anything's possible. Is uh, uh <clears throat> I was thinking about the bakery concept, and I thought, uh, will you have savory food as well? And do you um, want it to be a big place or like a smaller ventanita, smaller window place? I, I. The better answer is probably, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, being in Mexico City and seeing, like, what what is viable. Like, in Mexico City, you just have, you can see, like, little small coffee shops and 
pastry shops and stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Like they're producing really beautiful work in a small space. So mm. it's, it's nice to see what you can produce in a small space. And I like that idea. It's something that I'm very acclimated to. Like at Nopa, the Nopa pastry room is probably not that much bigger than this this square space here. Mm -hmm. um, and that pastry department pumps out so much. Like, well, at the time we were there, and I'm sure now still, like they're just, they're pumping out breads, um, doughs for the the sort of the savory side of the restaurant. Mm -hmm plus all the dessert components that get used up in their desserts. And I just, it was a really like good learning experience for me to see like you work small, you work efficient and you can get a lot done. Mm. Mm. But then it's also nice to be like, I've got this large workspace and I can do all of this stuff, you know, right. and, like churn out like hundreds of things. If, if you have like the space to do it in, to do it like in a way that makes sense. Right. Um, <clears throat> I get inspired by places that feel uh, that they they draw a crowd, um, whether that is a large space or not. I don't know. Um, I think I just wanted to feel like a community space, uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be huge. Um, but it, I mean, it, it like dream dream as big as I can. Like, yeah, it would be amazing to have a huge production space. You know where we're churning out like hundreds of conchas but realistically i think i'd be happy with with a small space mm -hmm. just yeah keep it simple small team small team consistent work good yeah. menu and as far as savory stuff there are a couple of things that are nostalgic to me um that food demo that i did at the ferry building that was i i kind of like went outside of what i people know me for mm -hmm. um but it was still like a bread item in mexico like regional mexico we have this like a really delicious um antojito or maybe like breakfast thing called mollete mm -hmm. which is like you take a bolillo you slice it lengthwise you spread it with refried beans mm -hmm. um you top cool. it with cheese and you toast that up it's so like the cheese is all like melty and bubbly and then you take it out of the oven and then it gets it gets served with like a fresh pico de gallo mm. salsa. And then if you really want to like bump it up, you can like add an egg on top and like, you know, you can keep adding more things to it to make it like sort of like a complete breakfast. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things that like you crave after like a late night out or like in the morning, like, yeah, I just want a mollete, you know, just. Damn. Yeah, it's just we'll so simple comfort food. Yeah. Um, I think I would lean towards like offering things like that, but not not in a full sort of breakfast capacity mm -hmm. way. Um, and I, yeah, molletas are delicious. They're they're classic. So you're not afraid to try something new. No. Right. Yeah. Is there any other cuisine that you'd like to explore? Um. I mean, I like to eat anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as far as like when it comes to like making my own stuff. Yeah. Would you um, like to draw any <clears throat> influence from anything else or like, you know? Yeah, I think right now for what I'm doing, I, I really just try to tap into what feels like Mexican right, natural, to me. Yeah. Um, I I really focus on what we have seasonally available here in California. So there's... A lot of my menu has like rotating like fruit, mm -hmm. whatever's in season, whether that's showing up as fruit or like jams. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I tend to just kind of try to stay in my own lane mm -hmm. when it comes to what I'm pulling from, which is it's either coming from like my childhood directly or from my culture. Um, and also like, also like I'm playing into a little bit of like, the Americana stuff that I, mm -hmm. that I grew up around with. Um, but I never try to like push too far out. Cause I, I, I don't know. There's for me, what feels most authentic is staying, staying within this, right. like, like Raquel lane. You hey, know? Yeah. You yeah. Know, you don't gotta be nobody else. Yeah. Fuck that. Um, but I, I love like going, being inspired by like having dessert at uh, other places, you know? Yeah. And like, that's, you know, if I go to, if I go eat at dinner somewhere and I have like a delicious, like if it's Chinese, for instance, mm -hmm. and there's some like 
jasmine and like like green tea or whatever sort of things i'm like always like okay well this is beautiful like how mm. how can i bring some of this into what i'm doing in a way that feels authentic you know can i tie this into anything that like is there any sort of overlap with these ingredients or or adjacent to to what like is already within our culture right. and sometimes there is you know sometimes you can be like hey i was inspired by this sort of citrus thing that i had at another restaurant but <clears throat> i'm going to like bring it mexican style you know and and like sort of have it and as a, as an inspiration but like flip it into mm -hmm. like sort of translate it into what i would see it as like in in mexico or for me anyway um what resonates as mexican fuck yeah 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 and your uh what's your favorite season Oof. it's like the fruit that you love using summer summer, summer okay Where is we are so lucky here mm -hmm. like you roll into berries and that's just quintessential berries but mm -hmm. then like you get all the beautiful stone fruit you're mm -hmm. still like you're still having a little bit of like the citrus kind of around but once summer hits and you're just like it's this bounty of fruit like it it becomes overwhelming you're like i don't know what else like I, i'm not gonna get mm -hmm. a chance to like get my hands on all of this fruit and bring it bring it out into the market because it's just it's just so much it really is yeah. You, get, you go to the farmer's market, there's like four stands with the same fruit. You're like, God damn. It's so much fruit, but it's also like the variety that we get. Mm. It's like you can have this kind of peach and that kind of peach right. and this kind of apricot and this kind of stone fruit and pluots. And like, it's just. What do you think <clears> of those <throat> donut peaches? I'm not sold on those. <laughs> Never had a good one. Yeah, they're they're fine. You know, they're not like. Kind of show up with their little. They're kind of cute. Shape, yeah, they're you know? they're just fun for their shape, maybe. Right. You know, I don't. Has anyone ever had a good donut peach is my question. Yeah. I yeah. don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> um, I'll have to ask, maybe tap into like one of like the, the peach farmers. Be like, what's up with the donut? Put a Susio pole out at the. Uh, yeah. At the farmer's market. Yeah. Let's see. Have, have you a, ever had a good donut peach? What? You're going to piss off the other vendors. You got to do it off season. Have a what's up with that moment. Yeah, yeah, there we go. What's up with that? What's up with that? Yeah. Could I couldn't set up shop at your stand yeah. and do a podcast yeah. while you yeah. come that'd on, be dope. Come on down to the mission market. Yeah. They'd, they'd love you there. Yeah. yeah. I'll stand right in front and talk yeah. shit all day. Talk talk with all like <laughs> the the Latino people there. They'd love you. Yeah. We need it. Yeah. Okay. You I'm go. down. Yeah. You gotta we're not going to tell the food wise. <laughs> You're just going to show up. We're just going to show up. We're going to do it. And then when they're like, hey, you got to get the fuck out of here. No. Nah, just be like, they'd we probably, don't know him. They'd probably appreciate the. I, appreciate the banter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Inter whoever thought like, about that. Inter do a live podcast. Chef entertainment at the. Because let's, let's face it. The band at the farmer's market. Come on. Yeah. Well, on. It changes. I, yeah, I'm not saying I'm not calling out anybody specific. Well, hang on. Yeah, they could. They I could never. Do yeah, better. I've never been at the farmers market and been like, you tap damn, into that. I love these jams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should check. Uh, definitely, that'd be an interesting concept to be like, yeah. hey, I'm here. Like, we're gonna talk to this person or yeah, be or, like, yeah, get to know your farmers. Step right up. Yeah. Seriously, have have you have like for me? That's one of like the most. Um, it's the best part of the farmer's market. It's one of the most fun and endearing things about being a vendor at the market. Mm -hmm. I love my customers. I love getting to know people. Um, I love seeing the regulars. I love like doing my best to remember everyone's names. Like There's something really personal to me about that. But that aside, walking over to the person that I'm going to buy my strawberries from and like just talking to them yeah. about the work they do, how long they've been working, where they're working from. You know, <clears throat> we're so lucky to have such a bounty here in, in San Francisco and like Oakland too. But when you talk to each farmer, they're like, yeah, they're, they're driving in from Watsonville. They're driving in from Salinas. They're driving in from like the North Bay. These are like two, one and a half to two hour drives. Yeah. Um, 
on top of people coming here from fresno sometimes yeah on top of like all the work they did to load up their trucks Mm -hmm. on top of like all the work they did to pick the fruit um the history behind behind their farms you learn about how the weather affects their work Mm -hmm. how it's been good or bad you know for them um there's something really beautiful about like like talking to them the day laborers uh you get to learn I think it's interesting. It's one of the things that I, I feel, I was talking to Selassie about this uh, not too long ago, but mm-hmm. there is this aspect around the people we work with in kitchens. And I think also for farmers that it's like, yeah, this is just our job. We, this is what we do. This is our livelihood. Um, <clears throat> and they've had, they each have like crazy stories of how they got here or mm-hmm. how they got started. Um, and they just kind of accept it as like, yeah, this is, as like there, there's this uh, coworker of mine who will be like, "That's how life is," you know, and like, it can be the worst of situations. That I think that many of us, with the privilege of having maybe, maybe grown up here and like a different lifestyle, like you're like, "Wow, they've crossed, you know, miles and miles of roads to get here, worked two jobs, three jobs." to like make a living here and support their family here and over there. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, see la vida, you know, or la, la. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's life. So, yeah. And then you're just like, no complaints, no complaints. They're just doing it. And, and it's this piece of our food industry that mm-hmm. I don't think gets like a light shine. Like these people are freaking heroes. Like yeah. bringing all this food, like that plate of delicious food, like, Ah. i just i use my hands it's all good um like you look back to the kitchen and it's like there's this whole army of men and women and people working back there who we don't know their stories and we don't know how how hard they've worked to bring you that yeah that plate or that piece of fruit or that vegetable there's something really um i think really special about those people working in, in the kitchens or or at the farmers markets. Um, That's why I do sucio talk. Yeah, seriously. Talk to heroes such as yourself. Yeah, you know well, what I mean? Don't I, cut yourself out. I don't know about that. <laughs> don't <but>. cut yourself <laughs> out. You see, you're calling all these people heroes. Yeah, you're a hero well, as well. All right. I'll okay, do. you mm. feed the community. You bring people together. People are enjoying your products well yeah. after they leave <clears> you. <throat> you're part of the uh, topic of conversation that comes up weekly to the mm. people that come see you. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's yeah. no, it's no small thing. And so just as you're recognizing all those other people, right, you need right. to stop a second and be like, yo, I'm the motherfucking shit out <laughs> here. Okay. North 54. North 54 is doing its thing. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. North 54, how can they find you? Website, locations, days of the week, email. Okay. Okay. So, uh, North 54, it's North 54.com. That's my site. It needs an update, but soon it'll be like, uh, Rosca de Reyes is coming up soon. That's like that King's Day bread okay. that we have. Um, so orders are going to open up for that soon. And um, Instagram is Norte.54. Mm-hmm. And and then weekly you can get my pastries at Nopalito. Like that's Monday, like seven days a week. And then at Grand Coffee we have Mondays and Wednesdays I'm delivering there. And then there's special orders. You can just... Reach out to me at north fifty four sf at gmail dot com if you want any special orders. If there's any like special things that you've had at the farmers market, and you're like, hey, I'd love to have a tres leches cake. Do you do that? I'm like, yes, I do. You know, uh, or like large orders of pastries. That's that's always I'm always available for for special orders like that. Hell yeah, yeah. Chef Raquel Goldman in the house doing it. Yeah. You know, out here. Making it happen. For Sucio Talk. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's a, no problem. We're going to have you on again at some <laughs> point. You know what okay. I mean? Like, this is going to be a recurring thing. It's okay. all good, you okay. know? Okay. We can get, to, tell me a baker that you want to talk to, and we'll get them both on the show. We'll get Ooh. you both talking about, yeah, that would be about really... confections. Yes. You know? Yeah. Like, look, this booth is big. Okay. We can, I mean, it's not that big, but we can get some people in here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's that's what I would like to happen. It's hard to make it happen, but 
with enough diligence. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I, <clears throat> like I said, I love highlighting. Um, I'm thankful that Selassie like reached out to mm -hmm. you about me. But, yeah. Um, shout out to Selassie for but sure. But I'm also a huge advocate of like highlighting like, other people in this work. Mm -hmm. Um, minority owned people, people of color, uh, or minority owned, um, not people, <laughs> Minor minority. minority owned people, no, the no, tables no. have turned. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, um, it's okay. But yeah. Anyway, people of color. I love, uh, I, I do love supporting. Like, I feel like when I'm in a quiet space, which I am now, I'm like, you know what, yeah. now's the time to like pump out energy to like anyone doing pop-ups, anyone, um, making making goods yeah hell yeah yeah bring those stories bring the stories up to the forefront that's what we do here mm -hmm. on socio talk thank you so much for being on the show yeah, thank you we'll be back next week this episode will probably be out tomorrow who knows okay 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 goodbye nos vemos adios boom all right that's it chef how you feeling yeah that was fun It's okay. You slap the shit out of my microphones. <laughs> I'm much kinder in person. <laughs>